Another important category of organic compounds are the lipids. Lipids are more commonly known as fats and oils. The main function of lipids include energy, especially long-term energy storage, unlike the short-term energy that we find from monosaccharides, and also structure, they're a big component in membranes, and communication. Some hormones are lipids, and they're important for communicating between parts of the body. If we take a general look at the structure of lipids, lipids contain a lot of carbon and hydrogen and very, very few other atoms. They're almost entirely carbon and hydrogen, maybe just a couple oxygens here and there. Because they're almost entirely carbon and hydrogen, they are relatively nonpolar. That means they don't like to interact with water and they won't dissolve in water well. The basic unit of lipids depends on which type of lipids we're talking about. We're going to look at triglycerides and phospholipids, and those are built from fatty acids. A third type of lipids are the sterols, and these are based on a sterol ring structure. So let's start by talking about fatty acids so we can talk about triglycerides and phospholipids, and then we'll get to sterols a little later. The structure of fatty acid is basically a long chain of carbon and hydrogen with a carboxyl group on the end. So it looks like this. So there's our long chain of carbon and hydrogen, and now to put the carboxyl group on the end. Remember that a carboxyl group is a double bonded oxygen and an OH on the same carbon. Carboxyl groups, remember, are weakly acidic, which is why we call this a fatty acid. Whether we're looking at a structural formula like this, or in the simpler form where we just use a bent line to represent a line of carbons with hydrogens, or a ball and stick model, or a space filling model, the general characteristics of the fatty acid are always the same. A line of carbon and hydrogens with a carboxyl group or a couple of oxygens on the end. There are three different types of fatty acids that I want you to know about. What I've drawn here is what's called a saturated fatty acid. A saturated fatty acid is saturated with as much hydrogen as it can have because there are no double bonds between the carbons. All of the bonds between the carbons are single bonds. This gives you a long straight chain of carbon and hydrogens. Fatty acids, because they have this long straight chain, tend to pack together well and be solid at room temperature, like lard and butter. Saturated fatty acids are considered less healthy. They don't provide as many health benefits, and diets high in saturated fats can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Unsaturated fatty acids are a little bit different. In an unsaturated fatty acid, you have at least one double bond between the carbons. So you take out a couple of the hydrogens and put a double bond in instead. Putting in a double bond causes a bit of a kink in the chain. So once this double bond is here, we no longer have a straight chain for this fatty acid, but it's going to bend up here a little bit. Because of this bend in the fatty acid chain, unsaturated fatty acids don't pack as tightly together. So at room temperature, unsaturated fatty acids tend to be more liquid, like olive oil or vegetable oils. Unsaturated fatty acids are healthier. In fact, there are some unsaturated fatty acids that are an essential part of our diet. We have to have them because our bodies need them, but we don't have the ability to create them ourselves. Our body can make all the saturated fatty acids we need, but there are some types of unsaturated fatty acids that we can't make, and that means we have to consume them in our diet. This figure shows you the percentages of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids in different types of foods. 
the orange color is showing you the saturated fatty acids, and the green and blue are showing different types of unsaturated fatty acids. And you can see that something like butter has a lot of saturated fats and not as much unsaturated. Whereas oils, like olive oil or safflower oil, have a lot of unsaturated fatty acids, the healthier kind, and fewer of the saturated fatty acids. The last type of fatty acid I want you to know about is something you might have heard about before or seen on food labels, and those are the trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids are an interesting combination because they have a double bond in them, like we see in unsaturated fatty acids, but the shape of that double bond is different so that the chain remains relatively straight, like we see in saturated fatty acids. Because the chains are straight, these act more like saturated fatty acids. And in fact, they're even less healthy than saturated fatty acids because we don't have the enzymes that we need to properly break down trans fatty acids. I heard one dietitian refer to these as being like the circulatory system's plastic. Once it gets in there, you can't really break them down to get rid of them very easily. Trans fatty acids occur in small amounts naturally in meat and dairy but we typically find them in manufactured foods. A lot of manufactured foods go through a process called hydrogenation, where you start with an unsaturated fatty acid and you hydrogenate it or add hydrogens to it. And that causes a lot of um, fatty acids to become trans fatty acids. That's one of the reasons why avoiding manufactured foods or foods containing hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils is typically considered to be a good idea. Now that we've talked about the structure of fatty acids, we can talk about how we can combine fatty acids to make more complex lipids. The first type I want to talk about are the triglycerides. Triglycerides are formed by taking three fatty acids and hooking them to a molecule of glycerol. Glycerol is a simple three carbon molecule that basically just gives us a docking port for our three different fatty acids. These three fatty acids are joined to glycerol by dehydration reactions. The main function of triglycerides is long-term energy storage. Triglycerides, what we commonly think of as fats, are a great way to store energy because they contain more energy per gram than either proteins or carbohydrates. That means you can pack a lot more energy into a smaller space. Here you can see the models of a number of different triglycerides. Can you find the three fatty acids that are part of each of the triglycerides? And once you've identified the fatty acids, can you figure out which of the fatty acids is saturated and which is unsaturated? A hint is to look either for a double bond if you're looking at a molecular structure, or if you've got a space filling or a ball and stick model, look for chains that bend. Where you see a bend, that's going to be a double bond, and that's going to show you it's an unsaturated fatty acid. Another important type of lipid we make with fatty acids is called a phospholipid. A phospholipid also starts with glycerol, that little three carbon molecule. And in two of the spaces on glycerol, we plug in fatty acids. So we have a glycerol and we have two fatty acids. But in the third space on the glycerol, instead of putting another fatty acid, we put a phosphate linked head group that's polar. So we've got a phosphate group in there and sometimes some additional atoms, like nitrogen, that can give more polar bonds. This gives phospholipids a really interesting property. We have one part of the phospholipid, that polar head group, that is polar and likes to interact with water. And we have another part of the phospholipids, those two fatty acid tails, that are very nonpolar and don't want to interact with water. We call this amphipathic, where one molecule has two parts, a polar part and a nonpolar part. What's important about this is it affects how phospholipids behave in water. When you put phospholipids in water, the polar head groups want to be close to the water, and the fatty acid tails want to stay away from the water. In order to make this work, phospholipids arrange themselves in a structure called a phospholipid bilayer. In a bilayer, we have two layers of phospholipids. 
One layer has the heads facing up and the tails facing down, and then the other layer has the heads facing down and the tails facing up. What this does is it gives our fatty acids a safe place away from water in the middle, while our polar heads are out interacting with water. What's really important about this is that the phospholipid bilayer, these two layers of phospholipids with the tails in and the heads out, is what is the basic structure of cell membranes. Without phospholipids, we don't form membranes, and without membranes, we don't have cells. So phospholipids form membranes, and that's super important for being able to have living things. As we go on to look more at cells, we're going to see lots of different models of phospholipids. One of the most common ways to model a phospholipid is to draw a circle for the head. So that's representing our polar head group. And then to draw a couple of lines hanging down to represent the fatty acid tail. So there's the head and the fatty acid tail of one phospholipid. You can see from the figure on the screen how these phospholipids form a bilayer. The last type of lipids I want to talk about are the sterols. Sterols are important for structure. We're going to see some of them in cell membranes and also for communication because many hormones are sterols. As far as the structure of a sterol goes, you can recognize a sterol by its structure of four connected rings of carbon and hydrogen. We have four rings of carbon that are all smushed together, and that gives us our sterol structure. The most common sterol is cholesterol. You can see from the structure of cholesterol that we have all the carbon and hydrogens in this ring, and then a little oxygen at the end. That makes cholesterol very nonpolar, and it doesn't like to interact with water. Cholesterol is found, however, in cell membranes, and it helps give cell membranes some of their uh, flexible properties. Your liver can synthesize all the cholesterol you need, so you don't actually need to consume cholesterol as part of your diet. In fact, some studies have shown that an excess of cholesterol leads to an increased risk of heart disease, which is why in people with heart disease, they work really hard to lower their cholesterol level, either through diet, exercise, or medications that stop you from using so much cholesterol from your diet, or keep your liver from making as much cholesterol. In addition to its role in cell membranes, cholesterol also forms the basis for a lot of steroid hormones. So a number of steroid hormones are based on cholesterol structure. We start with cholesterol, and then through a series of reactions, we can make these different sterols that are important hormones in the body. One example of a steroid hormone is the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol is released when you're under long-term stress, you know, something very difficult situation going on for a long time. It goes throughout your body and adjusts how your body uses glucose, it adjusts your blood pressure, um, it affects your immune system by actually reducing your immune system, and a lot of other effects. You really don't want a lot of cortisol in your body long term, but it's great to have for a little while to keep you going when you are in a stressful situation. Some other important examples of steroid hormones are the sex hormones. The sex hormones testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen are all based on cholesterol, so they all share the same four ring structure. Slightly different but similar to this structure of cholesterol is the structure we see in our lipid soluble vitamins. The lipid soluble vitamins are those vitamins that will dissolve easily in fat because they are based on cholesterol, which is a lipid and is going to dissolve in fat, not water. The fat soluble vitamins are vitamins A, D, E, and K. And you can see that all of them share the characteristics of having some of those ring structures that we see in cholesterol.